Um, Texas Fair Defense Project, uh, which is my organization, just to give you a little bit of background, um, works to improve the Texas criminal justice system with a focus on indigent defense. You, many of you will probably see me or people who work with me um, will come down to counties and observe court proceedings and interview people about how they're providing indigent defense. I'm mostly providing this background because we don't just sue counties. We are mostly doing research and publishing sort of public information about how indigent defense is working. So most of the time, if you see me in your county, um, we're just really there to find out what's going on. Um, so there are so part of what we do is do community education with defendants, to telling them about their rights, um, also do research and publication, and then we do, do have, we do have some litigation against counties, and that is what the roth Gary case was part of that program. Uh, the decision in roth Gary came down on June 23rd, 2008, and what we have here is Walt roth Gary's high school mascot, the John Marshall Lawyers. So he feels like he was put on a path to the Supreme Court early in life when he was in high school. And this is a picture of Walt. Um, I think I just want to start out a little bit by telling you Walt's story. Walt was a property manager who moved to Texas in the summer of 2002. He came to work for an employer. He had worked for someone in Arizona. They transferred him to Texas, but soon after he arrived in Texas, the new situation didn't work out, and he was let go. Um, and he was, the day before he was arrested, before, the day before the arrest, that's sort of the incident at issue in this case. And he was still living on the property the day after the arrest because they gave him a certain amount of time to get off the property after he was fired. The police came out to the property and found Walt with a gun. Um, he was, you know, basically in front of his house. He had a gun, and they came up and talked to him. They ran his ID, and the criminal background check came back showing that he was a convicted felon. So they arrested him for being a felon in possession of a firearm. The only problem was that that criminal database was wrong, and Walt had not been con convicted of a felony. Um, he had been charged with a felony before, but the case had been dismissed. And so he immediately began to talk, tell the police officers, tell everybody in jail, tell anybody who would listen to him, I'm not a felon. This is a mix-up. I need a lawyer to help me clear this up. You know, this is all a mistake. But because Walt's wife was able to post a small surety bond for him, the county did not appoint a lawyer to him because they, they were operating under a policy that said if a person bonds out, we'll wait and give them a lawyer if they're qualified after indictment. And so, you know, Walt was not, under that policy, did not receive a lawyer because he bonded out within a couple days of his arrest. It was about a six-month time lag between when Walt was arrested and when he was eventually indicted. During that time, he wasn't able to find a job. He had just moved to this community. He had just lost his job. Everybody in the community knew that he had been arrested for this and thought he had a prior felony conviction. And that, the, the, you know, they believed, they knew he had been arrested for being a prior felon in conviction of a weapon. He interviewed for a job once where they even had the local news story about his rest tapped up on the uh, kind of cork board behind the person who was interviewing him. His family lost his car. They were unable to find a place to live. They ended up basically swapping some ranch work for free housing uh, for someone outside of the county. He tried to do day labor for a while, but he was too old and really not in good enough health to get consistent day labor work. And so during the six-month period, he basically went from being you know, a relatively financially stable family to not having any housing, not having any transportation, not having health insurance, and really being in a hole that to this day he has not dug himself out of in terms of the debts he accumulated. He was finally indicted about five months after his arrest, and they sent out a warrant for him because the judge increased his bond. He was brought into jail on the increased bond and again asked for a lawyer. This time he spent about three weeks in jail before he got a lawyer who was able to get his bond amount reduced. And then pretty quickly after that, the lawyer was able to show that, yes, in fact, this was all a records mistake and he had you know, never had a prior felony conviction and the charges were without merit. Um, so the suit that we brought looked at was Walt entitled to a lawyer during the six-month period 
while he was awaiting indictment so that he could have had the charges against him lifted at a time before his financial situation kind of got as extreme as it did and that would have allowed him to avoid the three weeks incarceration he had when he was arrested after his indictment. So the questions that the Supreme Court looked at, the first, the main overarching question is does an Article 1517 hearing or magistration in Texas mark the initiation of adversary judicial proceedings with the consequent state obligation to appoint counsel within a reasonable time after a request for assistance is made? The court answered that yes. So that is now the sort of under the court's ruling when a person goes before a magistrate for 1517, it's now clear that that is when a criminal case against them is deemed to have commenced. And then the court articulated this in general terms that will be applicable to other states, so other states can find the point that is analogous to the 1517 hearing in their jurisdiction and apply the Roth-Gary rule to their situation. The uh, county, the court also looked at some sort of sub-questions related to that overarching question. And this one is related to how the Fifth Circuit decided the case before the case got to the Supreme Court. The Fifth Circuit had said, the point is not 1517, the point is whenever a prosecutor becomes involved in the case or aware of the case. And in the Fifth Circuit's rule, that could have been before indictment or after indictment, but you had to show some sort of evidence that the prosecutor had looked at and screened the case before the Fifth Circuit thought that a criminal case could be deemed to commence. And that was based on sort of this idea that only a prosecutor, that the prosecutor is the person primarily charged with initiating criminal cases in most states and certainly in Texas. So the court looked at, well, does the right to, a court, does the right to counsel attach at a 1517 hearing even if the prosecutor is not aware of the case or involved, even aware of the arrest? And the answer to that is yes. So no matter when prosecutors actually get cases in your jurisdiction, that doesn't matter for the purposes of determining when the criminal case begins and when the right to counsel attaches. It's when that person, it's, it's looking at the effect on the defendant when the defendant is brought before a court and held over on charges. It's not looking at who, which state actor within local government is involved in that. It's looking at what's happened to the defendant and what posture is the defendant in. And then this is probably, I think, before Roth Gary, what I heard most often when I was talking to local officials about when they thought the right to counsel attached. Lots of people argued to me that they thought the right to counsel did not attach until indictment. And the court also looked at that issue specifically. Is an indictment required before the right to counsel attached? And the answer to that is no. The court said they had resolved that several times in the past um, and that they were going to stay with their precedents that said it attaches prior to indictment if the person is brought before a magistrate for an initial appearance prior to indictment. The court also talked about why defendants need a lawyer early in the process or earlier than they were receiving counsel in many jurisdictions, including Gillespie County. And they focus on the fact that you don't just need a lawyer to show up with you at trial. You need a lawyer to help you get ready for trial, to help you prepare for other critical stages that may precede your trial. And you also have a right to counsel to help you prove that you're innocent, as Walt was. So I think the practical questions that counties are asking after Roth Gary was, OK, that's fine. But what does that mean? When do we have to give people lawyers? What is this new time frame? You know, how quickly do we have to appoint a lawyer? Under federal constitutional law, there's not a clear answer to that question even after Roth Gary. The court just says that counsel must be appointed within a reasonable time after attachment, after the 1517 hearing to allow for adequate representation at critical stages before trial as well as at trial. So within a reasonable time, but it's not telling you whether that's one day or three months. Um, and then th there's also other Supreme Court case law saying defendants are entitled to counsel to help them prepare for critical stage proceedings. So it's not enough to just have a lawyer show up with them at a critical stage. They are entitled to counsel to help them prepare for that and even to decide whether to undergo critical stages. Um, the case that I have cited there, Estelle v. Smith, is a case where a defendant was requested to um, submit to a psychiatric examination prior to indictment. And the uh, court said that the, he was entitled to a lawyer to help him decide whether to even submit to that procedure um, and to make that decision to whether or not to submit, and not at the time of the psychiatric exam itself, but before that. 